You welcome back. This is News Files, your most authoritative news analysis platform. My guest this morning, for the very first uh, segments, we have divided the program into two, as you how you may have witnessed uh, sometimes when that becomes necessary, as we did last week. So, my guest for the first segment, Mr. Seth Thekpe, his former Minister of Finance. Thank you for joining us, sir. Thank you. Always a pleasure to have uh, people who have served in the highest office um, in this area make time to uh, help us understand some of the issues. Um, you've been consulting and uh, not, not heard much in, in the political mm -hmm. you know, spheres. <laughs> yeah, there's well, a lot of politicking going on and we hardly hear you. Well, I, I, I do my contribution. There's, there's always a technical aspect to in the political issue at stake. Okay. And, and so I, I choose to join in clarifying All right. you know, the technical and professional aspects All right. of this. Okay, okay. thank yeah. you very much as always. <laughs> and um, you would understand that the second segment will deal with the bank crisis <coughs> and the end of the cleanup exercise by the Bank of Ghana. So he should be very, very useful um, and helpful to all of us. Also here in the studio, is Kobna Atabedu. He's a procurement specialist and a member of the Ghana Institute of Procurement and Supply. The body that have also issued a setting, you know, damning report about their own member, uh, a senior member. Um, I'm talking about the uh, suspended chief executive of the PPA. They are saying that he, they are going to investigate him. They are going to take disciplinary actions against him. So he's being referred to the ethics committee and we'll get to know the results. However, they have um, decried and denounced the acts found in Manasseh's documentary. Good morning and welcome to Newsfire. Good morning. Thank you very much. For Great to me. have you. Okay. Here also in the studio, is Clara Berry Cassetti. She's a lawyer and teaches the law at the Faculty of Law, GIMPA. Uh, she's also uh, on the board of the CDD. Thank you for joining us, Clara. I'm happy to be back Great. once more. And there are many people who are excited that you are on the show this morning because when we advertise, many people are so excited to have you. I'm happy to be here. Okay, all yeah, right. Well. Okay, so uh, contracts for sale. Don't call me. Watch this. A search at the Registrar General's department shows that Talent Discovery Limited has two shareholders. A Ajay, a majority shareholder of 60% of the shares, and Francis Ahin who owns the remaining 40% shares. The two are also the directors of the company, which was registered in June 2017. Speaking generally on how to expose people who try to vary their names in order to hide their ownership of companies, the CEO of the PPA, Ejene Mbwati Eje said, a number of ways could be used to reveal the true owners. Well, some people have a way, and I have dealt with some in the past. Yeah. They well, they will not... They decide to even uh, use, if they are using their names, mm -hmm. they decide to use, uh, pair them in a way. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you have three names, they can use Ajeni Mbwati to register one company, mm -hmm. use the Mbwati AJ to, to register, register another, another company, and then Ajeni AJ to register another company. Yeah. Do you, know, do, do, you know, do you know what some, uh, you see, when people are trying to perpetrate, uh, perpetrate any kind of fraud, I would say that at the time that they have the intention to do that, they are not so smart to look at the other implications. They can change and do this uh, in, in lottery, they call it what? Permutation. Mm -hmm. They can do all this permutation, but one thing that gives them out is they have the same address. Or you can locate one particular telephone number running through, you know, and it becomes so clear that yes, they tried, to, you know, as it were, um, uh, uh, navigate and, and, and manipulate the system. But there is something that will always, uh, you know, give them out by that kind of trail, you know. And we have seen it several times. Wow. Sometimes it's not the name, it's telephone number. Sometimes it's not telephone number, it's address, location. 
of the two directors and shareholders of Talent Discovery Limited, one of them pointed to the PPA CEO. The spelling of his agenim and a J are the same as those on the registration documents, even though the registration of the company does not have his middle name or its initial. Yeah. His official name, as found in documents he signs, is not Ejenim Ej. He is Ejenim Boateng Ej, but he signs AB Ej in official documents, including approval letters at the PPA. But there are more clues. Two of the companies of the TDL Group, Frosty Ice Natural Mineral Water and ABM Logistics Ghana Limited, have shareholders and directors, namely Mercy Ej and Ejenim Ej. The tax identification number of the Ejenim Ej in the registration of Talent Discovery Limited is the same tax identification number used by the Ejenim Ej in the company he jointly owns with Mercy Ej. My investigation also revealed that the wife of the PPA CEO is called Mercy Ej, so it is highly probable that the Ejenim Ej of the TDL Group is the same Ejenim Boateng Ej of the Public Procurement Authority. The address of Frosty Eyes, a member of the TDL group, is a street in Airport Hills in Accra, and that is where the PPA boss lives. My investigation revealed further clues that suggested that the head of the Public Procurement Authority was the same person who owned the company engaged in selling government contracts. In March 2018, there was a funeral in a brewery in the Eastern region and the three shareholders in the TDL group of companies all featured in the funeral invitation. The invitation named ABAJ, CEO of the Public Procurement Authority, as a brother of the deceased. It also named Francis Ahin, CEO of Talent Discovery Limited, and Mrs. Mercy AJ as in-laws of the deceased. Mercy AJ is ABAJ's wife, and Francis Ahin is ABAJ's brother-in-law. With this and other dossier of evidence, I confronted Ejenim Boateng Ej with the inevitable question. Mr. Ebi do you know of a company called Talent Discovery Limited? I do. Is it your company? No. Uh, do you, so how do you know this company? It's, it's a, a, a cousin of mine. Okay. We have information that this company has been brought here a number of times for approval, restricted Tendering. Yes. Did it come to your attention? Yes. And, and what I, did you I do did, about it? Yes, I did. I did declare at the at the at the board meeting. You have evidence to show? Yeah. Today? No. It's there. It's in our minutes. Yes, but I'm saying if we want to find out. Yes, it's we... in the minutes, so you can always find out. Okay. And what's the name of this your cousin? I wouldn't disclose it. You can have it if you want it. We have done our checks and it's not your cousin, but your name is on the registration document. It's not my cousin, he's my in-law, my brother-in-law. Your brother-in-law, yeah. what's his name? I, would, I will not disclose his name. Francis Ahim. Yeah. And then you are the majority shareholder and also a director. I'm not the majority shareholder. Okay. I'm a director. A director and then 60% shareholding. No. It is 50-50. You're welcome back. So that's just some five minutes of Don Komi, contracts for sale. And who is involved? The man at the very top. And uh, as we're playing it, um, the lawyer in the studio and the lawyers out there would definitely be wondering whether Manasi has some legal training on how to do cross-examination and the manner in which he did it so calmly. Many people uh, are surprised about that, and that was a commentary as we're playing it. Um, so, Clara, uh, just very brief to start with. You, you admire the calm demeanor in which he approaches it, but he does it in a way we are, told, we are taught in law school, that don't ask a question to which you don't know the answer if you are doing cross-examination. So he comes across to you as somebody who has all his answers and you are just seeking affirmation or denial of sin. So what else are you excited about? Oh, um, the, I 
apart from the be yes being calm definitely excites me also because it came across more like two pals having tea and just chatting no emotions just like a normal chat and then at the end of the day all the facts came out and then of course it's it's a bit embarrassing that you i mean you are just caught you realize yourself that you've been caught mm. more or less particularly because you attempted to lie at the very beginning. Mm. Excellent, excellent piece of investigative work by, by, by Manasseh. Mm. We are very grateful. This is great work. Okay. Uh, particularly <coughs> coming from the CDD, um, you, the CSOs, uh, you've been talking about some things, uh, even including the Ghana Integrity Initiative and SHRAG. They've been banding some figures about, and they say that procurement is the biggest platform for corruption. And they've been banding some figures about all the time. They say about three billion United States dollars is lost to this country as a result of corruption. So here in Ghana, we lose about three billion every year because of corruption. And we are not talking about petty corruption. Now, um, as a procurement expert, um, how do I call it? Tabedu. You can call me Kobla. Kobla. Okay. As a procurement expert. Um, Whilst you were watching and we're having the conversation backstage, you were talking about from I don't know about the company to it is my cousin, it is in-law, uh, I have shareholding, initially I don't, then 50-50 when in fact it is not 50-50, it is 40-60, correct? Um, and how the name was discovered and connected properly to him. Is this something that is new? Or this is only confirming something that is traditional in the procurement uh, system? OK, thank you. We, we do what we call pre-qualification. And at the pre-qualification <coughs> stage, you do a due diligence. So any. Uh, vendor who expresses interest in doing business with you. You don't, you don't just enroll the person. Um, first, you do the desktop assessment where you are checking is the company registered, if it's registered, what, what are the objects, most importantly, mm. what are the objects. Then um, you want to be sure that they meet the legal requirements, as in um, they have registered for tax clearance and then social security. So these are the documentation you check on and you verify these things. So you always want to be sure. Mm. More so because you want to be sure that there aren't people even within your organization who are conflicted in this. Because every process, procurement is a process, and it involves a lot of people within the organization. So you always want to be sure that there isn't any conflict of interest issues. So you have to do the due diligence. That is the first step. We go beyond this documentary exercise to look at the financials. So you want to be sure that the company has capital. And usually, you're, you don't want someone whose working capital is actually debt, because then you are buying cost of capital as well. Mm. So you want to be sure that the person has enough working capital of his own. That's why you take his financial statement over here. <laughs> yes. okay. And you want to look at his balance sheet, to look at whether if you net his assets and his liabilities, he will give you a positive figure. If, if the positive figure you get is lesser than the contract sum you are going to do, then it means if something goes bad with your contract and you want to hold him to it, his, his worth is less than the risk you are taking. Mm -hmm. So you may not want to consider. So all these considerations goes into it. So you, as a procurement person, your, your strength is not just in running the process. You need a strong financial background. You need a strong legal background as well to do all So, so the question generally, and for a brief comment is, is this new in how people try to beat the procurement system or to infiltrate it and unduly win contracts? It's not new. You, you, you notice that during their conversation, at the initial stages, he explained how people try to beat the system mm -hmm. and the fact that you always leave a trail behind. Yeah. It is something that, if, that smart. if you have practiced for a while, you would know all the games vendors play in order to get business. Apparently, he didn't and, know he was talking about himself. Uh, it's, it's a bit embarrassing. I mean, for us as a community, whilst I was watching this, I, I was holding my chin like this, my head was down, and I was saying to myself, Everybody always thinks that procurement people are corrupt, and we've been trying to say that we are not. That there are other people who are also interested, mm. and they perpetuate it, but we carry, we build the cuts. 
and this has not done us any good. Okay. And that is that is <coughs> the problem. How rife is it that the procurement process, people try to have, you know, as it were, insider information, try to beat the system. So if, because normally when you check the SNET, the, the tax, you know, compliance and stuff, you're also looking for the least evaluated, mm -hmm. the lowest, uh, the one who is proof. As in, at the, as, after they have submitted their bid and we are doing the evaluation, yeah. yes. So you may, you may want for supply of items and you are looking for an amount of, say, 20,000. And then somebody will come and be able to do, uh, uh, what is it, 19,000, so, so 19, We don't look at just the least price. Something, uh, yeah. We look at the least, the lowest evaluated bid, yes. which considers every other factor, including price. Okay. And we, we weight them and we score them, mm. and that gives you the lowest evaluated bid. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll come to a bit more detail about those aspects, and you'll understand <coughs> why, because there's some connection with one particular contract where the, 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 the price, as you know, it does, it, the suggestion is that the reason they want it could only be that there was an insider who must have given information to um, Ejenim's uh, entity, entity to go and quote a particular price, which was just like uh, one peso shy of the <laughs> correct price. Anybody who quoted beyond that has automatically sort of lost. Um, yes, so as, 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 as uh, someone who, who was in charge of the finance and economy of this country, Procurement would have been a major headache because people are awarding the contracts, but often at the MMDA's level, you may have to do some of the or most of the payment for the bigger contracts. So, what does this revelation tell you? Well, thank you very much. <coughs> um, well, it tells me that a lot of work. You know, has been done, but we still need to do more in the area of uh, <coughs> laws and regulations. Uh, also, um, in areas like code of ethics, you know, by departments and agencies. And let me say that PPA falls directly under the Ministry of Finance, anyway. So, right. this is. And you would also recall that, um, mm -hmm. given the number of issues that were coming up, you know, the PPA Act itself, which had been passed. You know, early, I mean, early 2000s, 2003. 2003, you know, um, it was one of the numerous or many, you know, laws which I was very keen to bring into the, you know, the uh, 20s. Uh, up at, I mean, 20, from 2014, we went through, so you will see that we, uh, public procurement, the banking acts, all the General GRA tax, internal data, all the GRA, and then we pass the comprehensive public financial management, which with hindsight, maybe we would have put an omnibus to cover the whole of the you know, public sector. It's not late, maybe an amendment to the Public Financial Management Act. And that's not to say that you do not have it in other laws, so compliance code and others. But I think so long as you have the PFMA, which is the overarching you know, act mm. uh, where we have strengthened accountability for spending officers, ministers, you know, down. Um, so what I would say that is that um, <coughs> this, from every development, there's a need to look at the existing law mm. regulations. Mm. Some of it doesn't have to be in a substantive law. It could be, you know, more in regulations, which is given the fact that uh, I don't think I'm wrong here. Um, in our case, regulations are subsidiary legislation, so they have, unlike other countries. Uh, so when we put things in regulations, because it's, you know, it has to go through parliament and all that, it has you know, a better force of law than, than you do have in other countries where regulations, mm. you know. Okay. Um, but let me also say, with respect to this, that um, usually the point that was made, um, contracts are often tiered in order to make room or say startups, and others who would then develop. And so the balance sheet it refers to, you know, it's kind of graduated. There are contracts in which startups cannot, <laughs> you know, bid and these things. Uh, the second <coughs> point I like to make <coughs> is that usually you score 
the technical and then the financial proposals. And mm -hmm. most weight mm -hmm. goes to the technical proposals. Okay. And it's the weighted average which ends up, you know, but that is not to say that, you know, these two aspects of the, you know, you know, cannot be manipulated or yeah. Okay. <coughs> now, Clara, the the facts as you watch the documentary, um, what would be your comment and the responses or reactions that have come from the presidency, from the, the board of the PPA, from the GIPS, uh, from <coughs> the coalition <coughs> of CSOs, which you, the CDD also, belongs to. Um, how should we look at this? Um, how to look at it? I actually do not agree. Uh, there are every society that, that, that progresses always has to take a, another look at its legal framework. I think that we have to look at our legal framework in other respects, but conflict of interest is not one of them. I say it's not one of them because now we, have, we don't have just one law. For example, the Constitution is not the only law. We have different laws. So we have the Constitution, we have Acts of Parliament, we have legislative instruments, subsidiary legislation. Then we have the common law. The common law is part of the laws of Ghana. And then under the, uh, under the common law, we have the doctrines of equity. And then we have, of course, even, to the, even including customary law. So we have a range of laws. Now what happens with respect to the subject of um, conflict of interest, for example, the Constitution defines what conflict of interest is. It, it, it defines what co conflict of interest is in the sense that it says that a person must not put themselves in a situation where their personal conflict affect, it, their, it, personal their personal, personal interest. interest conflicts yeah. with the performance of their office. Yeah. It's pretty clear and straightforward. So anytime your personal conf uh, interest conflicts with the performance of your duties as a public officer, you know you are in a conflict of interest situation. Now, I don't think it is any constitution should then go ahead to even ingrain in the constitution the scope of, 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 of conflict of interest. The common law doesn't lack. We can go through the acts of parliament. We have different acts of parliament. We have uh, subs subsidiary legislation. The common law is replete on, on principles of, of, of conflict of interest. So if we are really, it, I think it is our problem isn't that there is a lack of law. Our problem is, is that it's just the approach we have adopted, which is that sometimes we, I, I always say that sometimes we behave as if laws are prescription manuals or instruction manuals that when you pick, it tells, like for example, you have a, a manual that tells you how to assemble a phone. So laws don't work like that. Every, all laws have fundamental principles and at the end of the day, you are always going to look back at the fundamental principles where you think there is no express um, provision. And now come back. Actually, if you go back to look at the PPA Act itself, mm. it has an object. And the object of the PPA is including to be transparent and fair to everybody and not to disadvantage everybody. So the duty of the board and the CEO at all times is to ensure that the object of the PPA Act is achieved. So simple question. If you take the facts that have been assembled, when the company was incorporated, we know the objects of the, that it has to be transparent. Was there transparency? Is that, is, do we achieve the object of the PPA Act when we allow, for example, that if you are the CEO of, of a public institution, you can set up a company and have a financial interest? Here, the interest is clear. You have a financial interest because when you are a shareholder, shareholders share profits, basically. So that's a financial interest. You are a director. Directors are the minds of the company. They are the arms, legs, and minds of the company in the sense that they take decisions for the company and they are paid for the roles that they play in the company. So you, clearly you have a, a financial interest. Mm. Now back to even the PPA Act first of all. Is it the object of the PPA Act, if you look at the objects that we have, such a scenario, is that what achieves the object or that, does it defeat the object of the company. Come back to the basic, uh, basic law, which is the Constitution. The articles are clear. I think uh, even for us, it means conflict of interest was so important to us that it found its way into our fundamental law, which is the Constitution. Mm. So you, you add those ones together, come back even to the Criminal, criminal Act, Act 29. Act 29 expressly makes it a crime 
for you to abuse your, or your uh, uh, public office for private gain. So anytime you make a private gain with abusing your public office, you have committed a crime. It's a crime, straightforward. So it's not just conflict of interest. There's the issue of crime. So I actually can't understand why we, are, we, are, we seem to be suggesting as if this is something novel that is not catered for in our law. It is completely catered for in our law. Okay, so the difference is whether we want to look at the whole gamut of our laws and how we apply the laws as a people, or as we've often done, we want to come back. I say that we seem to think that uh, the solution to our problems is when we have a problem, we just go and pass a law, mm. and then we go away. Nobody's held accountable. I've, I've heard the CDD particularly, and uh, Dr. Kujia Santitu was on uh, Joy yesterday, and it does appear that the major concern of the CDD is that the Ghanaian, particularly public officer, does not appreciate the conflict of law situations or conflict of laws of the country. But what are you talking about exactly? Article 284 says, which is what you quote, that you should not put yourself in a situation yes. where your interest, which is personal, mm. conflicts with uh, your office. Exactly. Or is likely to conflict with. Exactly. Then we know that the way to... to to stay away from this is to make a disclosure. We are told, or you haven't read from the board, or you haven't read what they wrote to Manasseh also, that there was a disclosure and that he did not participate. Now, that is actually, that's why I say that if we can't approach laws as if they are instruction manuals. Now, there are certain conflicts of interest that cannot be cured by disclosure. Because if you allow situations where every type of conflict of interest can be, um, can be uh, sure. secured by disclosure, we are going to go into organized crime. And why I say we are going to go into the realm of organized crime where it is, is that now we can all make an agreement. So you are all board members, right? You have a company. You have a company. I have a company. Then next time. So we do gigs. Scratch my back. Yeah, we do gigs. Now, is that what the Constitution says that we should do is that how to protect the people if we do it? the gigs uh, is that how to act in the interest and welfare of the people absolutely not so there are yes one don't put yourself in that situation so in the first place you don't go and incorporate that's the, what the constitution says it doesn't say that you put yourself there then come and now ask make a disclosure you cannot put your you cannot ask okay before I come to that point, we must differentiate between a CEO and a board member. All the rules that apply to um, the board member apply to the CEO as well. Mm. But there are certain differences or certain nuances and variations. But he's For not example, only CEO. He's also a board member. Okay. I'm coming there. He's also a board member. It mm. is very important because, for example, if you are just a board member, for example, you can actually render professional services sometimes to your company. So for example, if you are just a board member and you're a lawyer and the, your company is in court and then you render legal services in terms of defending the company and all of that, you can be paid as a board member. If you are a CEO, that doesn't apply. If you are a CEO, you cannot say, well, I'm the CEO of the, the company, I am the person. Because when you're a CEO, you're also in charge of the day-to-day -day management of the company. You are an employee of the company. Aside being a director, you are an employee. Now, isn't this the case that public servants, as employees, can render professional services to, 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 to the, 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 the particular service where they are, offer, they, they are being paid a monthly salary for, for their services? Can they now go and do consultancy as well? Obviously not. You can't be an employee in a particular company, and then when you do your job for the company, you want to call it something else. So apart from being a board member, yes, all that applies to you as a board member applies to you, but you are also an employee. So the rules that apply to employees apply to you. And I say rule of the thumb, it's not very complicated. Rule of the thumb at all points for the board is what is the object of this institution? Your duty as the board is to manage the, the institution through the CEO to achieve the object. So you establish the policies, you establish the procedures, you establish the internal mechanisms that make sure that the objects are, are, are achieved. So if you don't do that, actually, and then you now come back 
and then you say that, well, I'll, for example, you come and say, we don't have a code of conduct. You're actually saying that we did not do our job. So we, the board, we did not do our job in the first place. And because we do not do our job, hey, it, to some extent, it's also, you know that inability, incompetence is a ground for, for dismissal. If you don't understand the job of a, a, a board, I think that you have an, an obligation to get understanding, mm. including trainings, so that we know how to hold one another accountable. I think we, we, we like too much, nobody takes accountability for anything. We are always passing the back and looking for excuses. They are usually not legitimate reasons. They are just excuses to get away okay. with. You hold with on briefly. Is. We will interrogate a bit more the questions that you raise, putting the facts squarely on the issue of the conflict of interest, as particularly the CDD and the coalition of um, CEOs who have issued a statement against what has happened uh, are talking about. But as a procurement practitioner, is it your understanding that at the level of the PPA, if you have to be a member of the board, if you have to be the CEO, um, you cannot, as Clara seems to suggest, own a company that you know may have to supply goods or you know, provide some services to the states for which a process involving that kind of selection and award may come before you. Okay. <clears throat> so first point is this. Um, number one, every, every human being has a fundamental right to survive and to live. And that includes to work, to make a living. So everybody has a right to have a business. The issue is would you be conflicted in pursuit of your personal interests? That takes us to the core of corporate governance and what good corporate governance is. The, the major issue with corporate, corporate governance is what is referred to as the principal agency dilemma, where the principal in this case is the state, and their agent is the board, not the employees. Now, the, the fiduciary duty of the agent is to at all times protect the interest of the principal, which is the state. So any time the agent's own interest or personal interest are at variance with that of the state, there is a conflict of interest. So if you have a, a business as a board member, and at some point in time, your business has to do business with the company you are sitting on its, on its board, you are in a conflict of interest situation. There are various mechanisms for dealing with conflict of interest. The first step is you need to declare. Now, generally what happens is that you don't declare at the time of the transaction. You should have declared beforehand when you are accepting the appointment that I have this company, these are my objects, this is what I do. If you have done business with the company before, you have to state that I have done business with the company before. If you haven't done business with the company before, you have to state that I haven't done with business with the company before. So if at any point in time, um, you, there's an opportunity for your business that you're affiliated with, you have a personal interest in, to do business with the entity, that is when you declare that my business is in the process of doing this business. And because I have an interest, I want to recuse myself. Now, that is supposed to be one of the cures. But it is not always n possible for that to be the cure. Because what normally people do is that when they get into positions and they'll be conflicted, they go to Registrar General's department and they remove their name from the list. And they remove themselves from the shareholder. And they substitute with someone else. But you see, what we forget is that that is the, just the manual aspect. There is the emotional aspect. Mm. Will the person be emotionally disconnected? It is not possible. So there are some conflicts you can't cure. Because emotionally, you can't take the person's interest from there. Mm. He's only put someone there to be the face, but his interest is still there. So it is difficult to cure these things. So um, we come to this specific, specific situation. Yes. The board cannot absorb itself. And I've seen the statement they've written, which tells me that they don't even understand what their role is. Because one, what have they said? for which you are making on the basis so I think, of the So I've read two statements they've issued. 
And the first, the second one is, is trying to expand the first statement they issued. And the bottom line is that they are saying that, they are trying to say that um, it is not our responsibility. Your responsibility is to direct the officers. So in terms of interest, it starts from stakeholder, it comes to the agent or the principal, it comes to the agent and it comes to the officers. The officers are the people who are doing the day-to-day -day work. You are supposed to provide them. So if you don't have a code of conduct, it is your responsibility to have given them a code of conduct. Interestingly, when you go to the manuals, the regulations, when you take the con uh, contract administration manual, there is a provision in it for conflict of interest, which covers contractors and all that. So it is not as if they are not aware that this must be present. Mm. So why is it that it doesn't cover them? And again, if you sit on a board and, and, and a board member and a CEO, so a director or an agent and an officer discloses his interest, but the interest comes to you 14 times, do you not see something wrong with this comes to you 14 times and you win all and we, are, we are losing no. even now do you even i'm asking a question he knows the facts so i'm asking do you win all you don't need to win all okay the i'm asking because that you have asking placed because, yourself i'm asking because, in the position of conflict i'm asking because we need to be fair to the facts mm -hmm. 14 times mm -hmm. successful six Nine, not successful. Mm -hmm. Two, pending. OK. So when it comes to conflict of interest right. as well, there's another dimension, mm -hmm. which has to do with insider trading. OK. Now, insider trading basically is because you have privileged information, you, are, you can influence decisions to your personal advantage. So here is how the process runs. An entity needs approval from PPA. The letter goes from the entity mm. to PPA, addressed specifically to the head. So nobody will see the content until the head has opened it, unless, of course, his PA opens his letters for him. Now, he sees it, and he will now, from what I understand the systems work there, he will direct a technical team or a due diligence team to do the technical or professional work and make a recommendation. He takes that recommendation and he goes to the board and he goes to get them to either approve or reject. The, when the request is coming, the information does, that comes includes the names of the companies and it includes the budget also, also that is available. So it means that at the time he's receiving the request, the budget is known to him. Before this, Annually, every entity prepares a procurement plan, and they will itemize all the activities. So he knows every entity and its budget and its plan of activities beforehand. So if a person, and I'm, I'm trying as much as possible to deal with the principal, not with the person. So if the person sitting in the conflicted position has privileged information like this, first it tells him that these entities are where the biggest budgets are. These are the specific projects that are coming up. You can prepare yourself and attack. That is the first step. So it goes to him. It goes to the board. The board approves. The, the contractor now goes to tender. Okay. At that point in time, if he has an interest, whether legal or emotional, that information can get to the vendor. Mm. And because he has privileged information, on the scope and the budget, he can tailor his proposal to suit exactly what is needed. That will be an, a disadvantage to the others. Okay. That is unfair. Okay. So that defeats the object of the act. Okay. Now, you speak about what gets to the board and the board gives approval. Can we delineate specifically what gets to the board? Um, Restricted tendering, mm -hmm. and this is what is involved here. Mm -hmm. The access. A procurement entity may, for reasons of economy and efficiency, number one, mm -hmm. which one is the procurement entity? ZPPA? No. Thank you. The buying entity. Thank you. A procurement entity may, for reasons of economy and 
efficiency and subject to the approval of the board, engage in procurement by means of restricted tendering. I'm asking, what does the board of the PPA approve? Do they approve a contract? Mm -hmm. Do they approve no, a contract? They don't approve a contract because there's no Do they approve a bid? They don't approve a bid at that stage. Thank you. So the law says, by means of restricted tendering, A, if by reason of the highly complex and specialized nature, goods, works, or services are available only from a limited number of suppliers or contractors. B, if the time and cost required to examine and evaluate a large number of ten tenders is disproportionate to the value of goods, works, or services to be procured. Or C, if an offer for competitive tendering fails to receive any response after publication, the authority may charge blah, blah, blah. So what are they approving at the procurement entity, uh, procurement board that we are talking about now, the PPA? Mm -hmm. What do they approve? OK. So they are not just approving a request to use this method. So if this method is in the law, then it's approved. But that's what the, the law says. No. It, the it's, entity that wants to procure the goods or services mm -hmm. simply goes to them mm -hmm. and says, we have a procurement to make. Mm -hmm. But we don't want to make it, you know, uh, public through the normal process, mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. use a restrictive tender, mm -hmm. approve it for us. Mm -hmm. They must now justify why they want to use restrictive tendering. And then the board will approve the method. So the board would approve the method on the basis of these three conditions. First, mm -hmm. is what you are going to do highly specialized, okay. such that we don't have enough people right. to do it. Mm -hmm. If it is not highly specialized, then it can be rejected. Two. If you look at the time it would take to run the tender process versus the value of the transaction. Mm. So if it's, let's say, the value is 5,000 CDs, and we have to spend, let's say, 6,000 CDs to run a process, then it doesn't make sense. So we would shortlist, the, uh, we, we cut short the process by using this. Mm. In this case, does it apply? No. Or if you have run a competitive process and you didn't get good responses, then it allows you to now zone in the market and find people who you think can. Pre-qualify them, that's the first step. Mm. And then you can refer. When it goes to them, because you are supposed to have pre-qualified them, they would also have, the due diligence team will have to do the same pre-qualification to ensure that, yes, indeed, these people have capacity to deliver this before they would say, you can go ahead. So you need to meet this. If it doesn't fall under any of these, then the default is competitive tendering. Okay. So the board is supposed to reject. Mm. So the board is not just looking at, is it a method that is in the act? It is. Let's go. Am I no. right to ask at this point that what the procurement PPA is approving mm -hmm. is not the bid, it's not a contract? No. Um, at that point, what they are approving, they have not been bid even, even, even at that point. So am I right to ask that they are just giving you am the I right opportunity to, ask to that? go away from the default position? Exactly. That's all. So am I right to ask that? Because when you are going for the default position, the law says you follow the rules. Who should follow the rules? PPA? And the entity. And the no, entity. not PPA. And the ent PPA entity is obliged to the go one by, by the rules. That, that's what the law says. They must follow part five, which is the processes that involve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is not PPA. Yes, that one I agree. It is the one who is seeking approval for to use the method of restricted mm -hmm. tendering. So if there's, there are no bids at this point, mm -hmm. are we really fair to the fact by suggesting what we are suggesting on the board and the PPA? If you read the responsibilities of the board, mm. they have a number of them, including providing technical assistance. So where the entity itself is caught in a position where they, they lack capacity. The reference point is the PPA. So their job okay. is not just to sit there and so take if, your, if, check if the So if you don't mind, do, because you want to chip in on this one, you can start from that point for me. Yeah. Um, we are looking for beyond the message uh, in Beyond him, I must add that. Beyond he, him facing the processes that have now 
you know, being uh, un unfolding. Calling on the board also to take, either to be dissolved or to take some sanctions and be investigated and all. Is it rather the entity tender, which, when they get the approval, go to now invite the bits, evaluate the bits, and determine who is qualified? That we must be looking at, or the PPA board. <clears throat> well, with the knowledge I have of this, I would be surprised if the committee set up by His Excellency. Uh, does not go to the entity level. The reason being the award of the contracts starts with the, with the entities and the number of entities from what I read in the media were involved. So you would have to find out how come, you know, PPA likely connection to, <coughs> to the ministries, a number of, you know, agencies, you know, that seem to, you know, churn out you know, and, the, and it may therefore go to the point it made some internal, you know, arrangements. So Before I will hear you say that uh, the Office of the Special Prosecutor or whoever wants to investigate anything, the real place to go is those who received the tenders, evaluated the tenders, and, and gave the award, and not the PPA and its board. Well, I'm speaking from a <coughs> professional perspective, mm -hmm. you know, like an auditor an accountant. If I'm given a job to do, I don't just look at, you know, I follow the trail. The source. And I, the source. And I think that if it's, it will be, <laughs> as I said, I'll be, you know, very much surprised, you know, if, you know, the, the link does not go there to find out what, because you want to kill, I, I believe, the work of the committee, the work of the prosecutor, Shraj, and others. And from being familiar with the work which Shraj and others have done in the past, they will definitely, do, because they are looking at process. Let's not forget, the process mm. begins, mm. you know, and so if there's been an abuse of process, it's starting, you know, at the entity level. So most likely to be covered. But back to the board, which is where I wanted to, um, I think we all agree that what you read is the exception. The default position is competition, open, for a number of people to yes. base on a contract. And that, I believe, professionally raises a higher level of standard even when it gets you know, to the board. So yeah. I believe that what some of the entities are saying is for the board to be held to a higher level of standard. I don't know if that means instant dismissal or whatever, but the fact that uh, it seems to, from again what I've read, it seems to affect you know, restrictive you know, tendering, so sourcing. And remember in the public discourse, you know, I mean, political economy, public financial management, protect, protection of public funds. The most commentary is on social sourcing. The most com yes. commentary is mm -hmm. on restrictive tendering. Right. You know, and this is a context in which, you know, I say that, um, in fact, that is one of the, not the only one, but one of the prime motivations for even improving the law and the regulations to make sure that, you know, you go down to course of conduct and other, you know, levels. So we are dealing with an issue which I think, as you said, it's, it's bigger than just the PPA. And if you may clarify briefly again, yes. by your understanding, because this entity <coughs> falls under your ministry, when, as I'm talking about you, as when you were finance minister. Earlier, I was, I was, I was telling Kobna that I have sat on an entity tender at the University of Education, whenever, and just as their lawyer, but I don't claim to understand it as much as they do, as, as professionals. Yes, sir, yes. So what's your understanding? What is the role of the PPA and its board? When do they come in? Well, the, the, uh, the PPA has, you know, it's, it's, in, that. it's, it's in the act. It's in the act. Right. Yes. Well, it's well laid out. It's, 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 it's well laid out, you and know. This, this in, was under monitoring yes, and compliance. Yes. Yeah. Its functions, as in many laws, are spelled out. Mm. Um, as um, a colleague said, object of the authority, object of the authority is to harmonize the process of public procurement in public service to secure judicious, economic, and efficient use of state resources in public procurement. And the sure general that broad functions. This is a broad, yeah. but then it goes in detail to the functions. Mm. And you can see it's a very long one. And normally at this point, there's a technical input, mm. right? We can say it has broad oversight, right? Protection of the public best. 
and it has some oversight over the so when you go before the PPA, PPA when you go the, before the PPA you go as a ministry a department or an agency yeah. where you have what is called the tender entity okay or entity tender entity, entity, entity yes. tender committee yeah. mm -hmm. you go and say I want to buy this cup but I want to use a restrictive tender process give me approval to use that process correct yes at that time nobody has sent in a bid mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there would be a list of companies mm -hmm. because these are the ones you feel can give you what you want for the sake of yes. our audience can i run you through the process yes do yes. do okay yeah so what happens is that let's say let's use the roads ministry there is the need to do, build a road for chamba somebody will make a requisition the requisition there must be a budget for that requisition to be approved then it will go to the procurement unit mm. they this would work with PFM, sorry mm. they, PFM, they would work the budgeting aspect yes. yes they will work with the engineers to design the road and build the quantities then procurement will have to do the tender at that point they will decide should it be competitive because that is the default yeah. For whatever reason, if we decide that maybe for expediency, emergency, whatever, we, can't, we don't want to go competitive, so we want to use restricted tender, the act says that go and get approval. Now, when you are requesting for approval, you need to tell the PPA that for these reasons, I can't do competitive tendering, so I want to use restricted tendering. And I want to use these people. And I have pre-qualified these people. So at the entity level, if they had done their pre-qualification, and pre-qualification is not just to say that, uh, give me your company registration document, and that is it. If you do due diligence, you go to Registrar General, and you find out who are the shareholders, and all that goes into okay. it. You can now lift and see who is this individual whose so, name so is So that, let's, let's tie in the fact. In a situation where the Ejenim Boateng's company is getting Ejenim Boateng AJ's company, mm -hmm. There are two Just million million million. Things around. <laughs> around. Um, it's getting a road contract. Mm -hmm. One of the first things, because of it is restricted tendering mm -hmm. to look for, is question of expertise. Yes. This company is formed in 2017 yes. with no track record yes. of having built a road. Mm -hmm. So at the entity level where they did the pre-qualification, mm -hmm. they would have to have disqualified it. Is that yes, correct? Yes, of course. Because part of the processes which are also lifted, listed in mm. the act mm. is, is that they must show, demonstrate that they have equipment. Mm -hmm. They have engineers, key personnel. So you have to state who your key personnel are. They can go further to take their certificates, confirm that they are indeed qualified. Okay. So there's a detailed So if the, if the process was process, influenced or compromised, it should where, have been caught where, at the entity level. Entity level. Yes. That's where it would have happened. That, should, that is where okay. it should have been stopped. Mm -hmm. But if assuming the entity they didn't have capacity to do all this mm. so they presented to the authority the authority has a due diligence team the name is due diligence team right they are supposed to do due diligence mm. so they should have found this out okay and if they had found this out it should have been in their report and he that the due diligence team is his team is his team he set it up that reports to him okay he's not required by law to set it up but he set, he it, set up. it up yes okay so, so now so, he says so this is up. it clear to you mm -hmm. that the Santa Maria project, mm -hmm. the Works and Housing Ministry, mm -hmm. earmarked two million mm -hmm. for that project? His company won the bid with one million nine hundred and ninety nine thousand six hundred and forty five. So it was 399 and uh, uh, 55 pesos mm. short okay. of the budget. Okay. When you have something like this, as an experienced procurement person, your antennas always go up. Okay. How is he so close? Because what happens is, if, assuming it was competitive and there were 10 companies, mm. you would always find out that if it's a fair market price, they'll cut cluster around a certain figure. That's right. Then you have outliers. The outliers will be those who are far above or far below okay not when you, if you experienced enough when you see the far above or far below it tells you that they didn't understand the scope very well mm. so we are not looking at apples do, and apples do you, or do you then, so you want to do a do you then say those who are suggesting oh they could have taken the contract and giving it to whoever mm -hmm. 
are they right in that suggestion? It because is here, done, it is not the pre qualification management. They ought to confirm that you have the expertise, you have the money, and all of that. And they qualify them and push them through. It is not done in, in contract management. They sell management. the contracts for, is it 18 to 15 percent? 15 percent, yes. It is not done under contract management. And I'm sure if you go and pick the ministry's own contract, you find out that there will be a provision that says that you cannot assign Novate or whatever to a third party without a prior approval of the buying entity. Mm. So the fact that they are even trying to assign it without a prior approval is a, a, a material breach of the agreement, which makes the, the contract voidable. Mm. I, I'm staying on this, this because, he, because this is his area. Just one, one minute, and then I get, I get my guests back in, the mm. other guests back in. The question is, so it is clear that there is complicity. The in board this is whole complicit. Process. And that, and that you cannot, it may be difficult to find how he may have influenced the process for his company to get the contract, but it is there. It happened. It has happened, yes. And you see, when they do the investigation, and don't forget, the OSP, the Attorney General, and Shirat, they have the powers that allows them to go deeper. Okay. In investigations of this kind, they can go to the extent of taking your phone call records mm -hmm. and the company's phone call records and see the number of times there's an interaction between them. Okay. All these things would establish, so if you say you don't have an interest here, mm -hmm. all these things would establish whether you don't have an interest here, but we are seeing okay. a lot of communication Thank here. You. So Thank what you. is it about? So, uh, Clara, and the Occupy Ghana actually says, not only conflict of interest, but conflict of duty. And they are saying that all contracts that may have been won by companies associated with the head, bastard, that all should be audited. Is that the way to go? Um, I think the, okay, I, I like to separate the issues. Okay. For me, conflict of duty is conflict of interest. Conflict of duty mm -hmm. is conflict of in, conflict of interest. Yes. Okay. Because it means that you you have a, you have you are kind of conflicted whether to give my is there's, is, there's, 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 so there's conflict of interest. Mm. Now I think we have to look at we have to delineate the issues separately okay. so that we can look at them comprehensively. The first level is he talked about restrictive tendering. If we are going into the for example, they would have first come to PPA to ask that we want to do. Restrictive tendering. Should we do it? Cobna, is that correct? Correct. Yes. And then PPA will say, yes, do it. Now, the law provides instances where PPA should be able to say yes, which means that if those circumstances do not arise, mm. PPA should have said no. That's what we read out. Exactly. Mm. So there is that bit of it. But even before we come to that bit of it, there is the general bit. And the general bit here is that an employee of our company has a, a company that is bidding for jobs that we, I mean, within the public domain to do this. So to begin with, within, is that what our procurement process as a country is supposed to be, that our employees can do this? There's that separate leg, mm -hmm. which you deal with first. Then you come back to the, the, now the actual substance of it, which is the contracts that have been won, where they obviously won. When we talk about the issue of, if he talked about inside dealer, actually that's also a crime. Yes. yes. In the sense that because of the, that's abuse of office. Mm. Because because you have this office, you are privy to this information. The section 63 of the act clearly prohibits it, that exactly. it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen. Mm. And up the, the criminal act as well, mm. the yeah. act 29. But, but people in this, well. in this area will tell you that insider dealing is, is, is widespread. It doesn't make it right. So, it's widespread. So what's yes. the suggestion? Because, so we have, what, what we're actually saying. Like the that, system is really rotting. The yes. system is not rotting. Manasi is giving you the evidence of what the goes The system on. is not rotting. I always say that when we say the system is rotten, is it some trees and then phones that are just lying somewhere that people? get rotten themselves? <laughs> <laughs> Who is the system? Okay, is so people? proceed, you were doing a setting analysis. So, no, so the system yeah. is not yeah. rotten. Okay. What the issue is, is whether the people in the system want to do the right thing or they don't want to do the right thing. Law is like the Bible. Sometimes you can justify it with, if you want an excuse not to do it. Mm. Even when the, the excuse is not legitimate, you can still ignore and then give all kinds of excuses why we don't want to do it. It doesn't mean that, okay, it's right. So I actually don't get it when we say, we are really saying that we've been doing the wrong thing all along. 
<laughs> and so, yeah, big deal. So what's the purpose of the PPA? Then mm -hmm. let's just, I mean, dissolve the PPA. We don't need a PPA. Okay. So we shouldn't have one. Mm -hmm. why, why should we have a PPA that the, we are the paying processes that have started, monies to? Your group of C CSOs, you're saying you don't want any further, you know, uh, dilution of the process. It should stay with the OSP and Shraj, no more. Why? Um, I, I wouldn't, I don't speak for the CEOs. I, okay. I'm here in my personal okay. capacity, so I will keep to my mm. personal views. I think if there are other state institutions that have the mandate to look into it, I don't see why they shouldn't. It's just that how they coordinate efforts is the problem. Fundamentally, I actually have a, a, a problem with so the, the legal problems framework I think we need to look at is actually the, the proliferation of state institutions where we make them conflict. And then we have too many people sometimes doing the same thing. And then it makes it confusing and all kind of. So there's that problem. I think a more effective way is for state institutions to be able to collaborate. State institutions are able to collaborate, should be able to collaborate because they all have one client, mm. the people of Ghana. Okay. So if we are all interested in protecting the people of Ghana, I don't see why we cannot collaborate. So yes, in this situation, I don't expect, it w I don't think it would be good and prudent for each state institution okay. to be individually looking at this, but there's mm. nothing wrong with all the state institutions collaborating. Okay. So for example, IOKO has expertise in A, B, C, D. The OSP has expertise in A, B, C, D. Even mm. if the OSP is leading it, mm. there's nothing wrong with the OSP asking the IOKO that you have expertise in A, B, C, D. Can, you, can I have access to your expertise to, to, to solve this problem? So in short, all the state institutions can collaborate. Okay. Okay. To work this, we just shouldn't have duplication right. and. Okay. Um, so, I didn't so, finish so on the, 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 other, the other aspects of it. Okay, quickly. He talked about the objects of the company. So now, what is the object of the TDL? If, for example, your object is that you can execute a contract, it's not the same as I want to sell contracts. So there's also that bit. There's the disclosures that, that came up and all there, that's when, when you go in deeper into the entities. It should, we should all want to know what are the objects of the TDL. Okay. So talent need, discovery company. But it will have stated objects in its regulations. Mm. What are those objects? So will you, clearly, on the face, talent discovery will not be qualifying for some uh -huh. of the jobs you have seen. You exactly. Have seen. Now, when it comes to business registrations, mm. the name can take the form of the objects mm. or can be completely different. different. So the fact that it's called talent discovery doesn't mean that it has anything to do with talent development and talent discovery. But so the, it's the, a name. Just like you can call it TDK and you are gone. Okay. But to add okay. to that, the, the, the Registrar General actually has a discretion where she thinks your, your, your yeah. name is misleading yeah. to not yes. allow yeah. you to yes. use, so, so, so to use before, the name where just it's one, misleading. Just one minute. Mm -hmm. the, your, your, your group, mm -hmm. the institute, yes. what are the likely outcomes? Okay. So there are, f there are different levels. What's the worst that he's likely to suffer? Um, the worst that he's likely to suffer, is not just with our group, but also with Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply in UK, because that is where we take our certification from. And we have a code of con mm. conduct on mm. both levels. Right. So at the SIPS level, mm. the, our code of conduct says here that um, as a member, I will maintain the highest standards of integrity in all business relationships by rejecting any business practice which might reasonably be deemed improper by never using my authority or position for my own personal gain, by ensuring that the information I give in the course of my work is accurate and not misleading, by striving for... What's the worst he's likely to suffer? So the worst he's likely to suffer is that the institute could revoke his certification. And the sad thing for us is that he's a fellow. He is one of the few people who chatted in Ghana. Okay. In fact, he chatted in the early 1980s mm. when the profession wasn't even known. Okay, thank so you. What should happen, Mr. Tepe? Tepe? What should happen? Excellent. Well, I, I, I wanted to get to this mm. point earlier on uh, because um, he's also a professional. And in the hierarchy of doing things, the legal, which is all professional bodies, I believe without exception, have, you know, even ethics committees, you know, and the rest. And, you know, that was the point I was going to be, but I think he's covered it you know, um, <clears throat> adequately. Let me also just, you know, state that um, um, we, are, we are talking about a specific issue. Mm -hmm. But there are instances also mm -hmm. where you could give pricing guidelines. Mm -hmm. If I have a budget or if I know what I want to buy, you know, I don't want to waste time at the evaluation level, you know, with, you know, fishing and all that. So I might give some pricing guidelines. I might give, you know, 
Um, and and that, that itself <coughs> is also. On the issue of disclosure, again, let me also say that you know, we, we are dealing here with you know, procurement entities. And, um, there we have instances, you would agree with me, where, say, an MP who has a practice, accounting, legal, you know, often gets the permission of um, <coughs> the speaker, right? Or a minister gets the permission of, say, the president or staff to, to practice. And that is within a certain limit, you know, lim within the fact that there may be issues that may come, say, to parliament, to your ministry, or whatever, which, you know, uh, some go to the extent of putting their, their occupations in trust, right, in trust, you know, whilst they are, they are in public office, especially when it has to do with, you know, businesses management, you know, and others. So the, the issue we are, we are discussing now has a wider, you know, application. I think that we need to look beyond just the procurement, and that's why I said, to the extent that this particular issue at stake has to do with public finances, you know, then we need to strengthen. Uh, but I do agree also with the point that was made that um, often the guidelines give even may give even examples. Mm. You know, so the the law, the regulation is not enough. But uh, if I come to tax practice, for example. Um, beyond the, the, the tax law and the regulations, um, the guidelines that GRE often issues goes to specific examples. So for example, if you say that, you know, there's a law that says you are blocking, you know, we have to block, you know, um, input tax credit, say, for, for VAT, if I may go to my favorite area. It may give you a specific example, what used to pertain and what you know, so I think this is the sense of which um, I, you know, endorse the fact that we should look beyond and give specific, <laughs> mm. you know, examples for okay. guidance of, you know, this. All right, so we are getting to the next segment, but uh, very, in 30 seconds, Clara, those who are saying the president could have done more than he has done, are they correct? Could he have sacked him straightforward? To be able to answer that, I need to have seen the letter of appointment of the CEO, which I haven't seen, so I am unable to. The only request I would make is that I think the contents of the appointment letters of CEO, CEOs should be public documents. The power the to reason... appoint by the president includes the power to disappoint. Yes, but so under, what's the, the big deal? under the PPA Act, mm. what it says is that you, when you are going to dis he, he's terminated in accordance with his letter of appointment, mm -hmm. which then means that how you appoint you, you, you dismiss him, has to be contained, is what is contained in... Dismissal? Yes. Not exactly termination. Dismissal is termination. Yes, but dismissal for wrongdoing must go through a process? It depends. It, it really depends. What, 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 the what is the purpose process... of the constitutional provision that you can only dismiss those people or take actions against them um, with just cause? We have... The, there are... There, yeah, it, so there must be a reason. Yes. Is there a reason the president should have just gone ahead to say get out the constitution in there is a reason no but there is a reason but sometimes with, with respect to the procedure for dismissal it depends okay. so i haven't seen his letter of appointment mm. and the act says that how you terminate him or the grounds how you terminate him is determined by his letter of uh, appointment okay. so yes i can see that now the suspension Yes, you may also want to now go through the normal process, which is that you have a, 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 a committee to, you give him opportunity to be heard, exactly. you invite him, and then you put the facts before him. Mm. There is that. There's the chief of staff mm. could have used an HR process. Write to him. You know there's summary query, dismissal and there's... Make sure he responds. And after that, if you are not satisfied, terminate him. Okay. There's always summary dismissal. You know, there's a last point you said you wanted to make. So 15 so seconds, as a let's way, go. As mm. a way forward, mm. one... If you look at the fact that the guy, the manager said that there are people that they pay. This is a key point you said you wanted to make. You must they, make. They need to go and deal with that aspect because it involves bribery and corruption. Mm. Then the next thing is going forward, we need two things to be done. First, we need procurement practice to be regulated. We need, just like Institute of Chartered Accountants okay. and Institute of Architects, All right. we need a regime mm. to regulate it. Okay. And Thank so you. that we can hold on Thank you. Thank you very much. And we take a break. When we return, We'll deal with the matters uh, involving the bank, the financial institutions, men's gold, and the cleanup having come to an end. What's next?